Hello, it's Brian and Jessica here. So we wanted to come to you before this episode begins and say a few little words that we didn't include in the actual interview that we thought were important to say. So this, honestly, this two-part adventure we're about to take you on is gonna be our fa my definitely my favorite videos that we've done. Um, and I think they're really the most important videos that we've done to this date. Like we've shown you all of our lives and what we've done to get to this point and how we've lost weight um, but these are two people who can really help you make that change. The information that they have can really put you in the right mindset to do this for life. And Ray Cronice is one of those guys that we heard of back in the very early stages of when we were, we were looking mm -hmm. into doing this. Um, I read a book called Presto, and Pendulette ref lovingly refers to Ray Cronice in that book as Cray Ray. Um, he's a little out there, but he's a scientist, and he helped. He's the he's the guy. Like the 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 reason why you know Penn was able to completely change his lifestyle. He figured out all this stuff. Um, he's also lost weight himself which is a really, you know, I think it always helps when the person that you're dealing with has been there themselves. Mm -hmm. They know what it's like to be overweight and that kind of stuff. Um, and then Juliana just brings a whole new side to the, the, the combination of the two of, the, of these people. Um, and I can't tell you how just like, we were geeking out, let's be honest, um, to do this interview and how we just feel like it's, we just, I have absolutely had a blast having this opportunity. They were so generous with their time. And um, I feel like this is really important stuff. So please, I know these videos are gonna get a little long, but please stick with it and watch the entire thing. I promise you they're full of really good information and um, information that could change your life just the way it changed our lives. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's get to the video. On our YouTube channel, we can really only talk about our feelings and experience. We felt it was time to bring in the experts. Welcome to Crocs in the Kitchen. I'm Jessica. And I'm Brian. I'm Juliana. And I'm Ray. Yes, we did feel that it was time to bring in experts on this subject because we're not experts. We aren't any kind of doctor, scientist, or anything of the sort. And so we felt that it was absolutely time to bring on some amazing, amazing people who have now since become good friends of ours, Ray and Juliana, authors of The Health Span Solution, which is an incredible book that we have been reading and going through. We haven't been able to make a lot of the recipes because we haven't been able to go shopping to buy stuff. But and we do have little tabs marked. Yes, we do. So I think we should introduce these fine fellows, but the, here's the thing. We wanted to write an introduction for you guys, but we didn't feel like we were good enough at it. So Brian is gonna read the introductions. Okay, these are literally just the introductions <laughs> off the back of your book. <laughs> oh no, here uh, we go. <laughs> Juliana Hever, MS, RD, CPT. Yeah, I'm gonna read everything, so. <laughs> That's the plant-based plant dietitian uh, has a BA in theater and an MS in nutrition, bringing her biggest passions for food, presenting, and helping people. That was supposed to be bridging. But... Bridging! Sorry, I'm <laughs> botching this royally, aren't I? Uh, she has authored four books, now five books, right? Right. Uh, including Plant-Based Nutrition, Idiot's Guide, and The Vegetarian uh, Diet. Vegetarian. Vegetarian. Yeah. It's hard I'm to sorry. say. It's hard to it's say. It's very hard to say. I'm not a good reader. Uh, Juliana... Ju <laughs> Juliana <laughs> is the co-founder uh, and nutrition director for Ephoros. Yes, sure. perfect. Good, I got that one right. And she speaks and consults with clients around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Cronice, uh, BSC, is a scientist innovator focused on diet and nutrition and co-founder of Ephoros, a lifestyle transformation company, a former NASA scientist, and Matthew Kenny and Blue Lotus culinary graduate, He's collaborating with leading academic researchers to publish work at the intersection of health span and plant-based diets. You got you really it. Have you got that. it. Thank you. I don't need to practice you nothing. Really that was perfect in that. one take. That was horrible. It was awesome. I loved we it. We love it. You're supposed 
You're supposed to have like the announcer voice. Uh, it's hard it's to fine. do the announcer voice that's when fine. you're doing long drawn. Like, so, you know, it, it's all real. And that's one of the things I think everybody yes. loves about your channel. And I hope mm -hmm. people, you know, get to know about us is that it's real. We're not yeah. making this stuff up. We don't like yeah. sort of eat one way in private and then, in, you know, in public do something different. This is just our life. And it's just been yeah. fantastic to, to get to know you guys. Yeah, no, Ray, secretly we follow a keto diet, you know, we just, we just do this <laughs> yeah. for the YouTube. Uh, but, okay, so uh, I have spent hours, literally, hours. I was going to say we, but it's really just me. It was just uh, her. Hours cultivating this Q&A, putting together all these questions, reading through the book, highlighting with my highlighter, and um, getting all the questions that we got on social media. So I think this ended up being about like half our questions and half questions from other people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, for all you out there who are watching, we're not gonna be able to get to everyone's question because there are too many questions and we would literally be filming this for six hours. And, and I don't, I Also, don't. There, were, there were a lot of like duplicate questions and yeah. just asked in slightly different ways. And so we you yeah. know, made them a bit more concise and so, put them all together. So I wanted to talk about the book uh, really quick, just for a second. So this is the book, The Health Span Solution. Everybody buy it, obviously. Um, <laughs> but I, this book has actually, it's interesting because we've been doing this for almost two years now. And this book has kind of changed. It's, I've been reading it over and over and it's kind of changed my mentality on how I look at all this stuff. And it's actually fascinating to me that we've act, we've been able to lose as much weight as we have sort of on our own and kind of put this together and just, you know, we we have a lot of, well, I have a lot of determination. I mean, we both do. <laughs> we but. both do in our different ways. Um, but I am kind of like laser focused when I want to achieve something that I'm going to, I'm either all in or I'm not in at all. And so I think that that has definitely helped us be able to lose weight. But it's interesting now that we've done this for so long and we've heard so many different things. We've heard, this is the way you should do it. This is the way you should do it. You know, this is everything. And I think you guys have done a really good job in the book of backing it up with the science and then outlining what people should do. So if you guys don't have this book, obviously get it. But also I wanted to point out, cause it's a lot of, it's a lot of science for me in the beginning. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot Even of Even history. Stuff. There's a lot of history and I do not like history. <laughs> Brian loves history. Brian loves Love history. He's obsessed with history, but I am not a history person. But I encourage everybody to not to resist the urge to just skip on to the recipes and actually read the beginning of the book because there's a lot of good stuff in there. I'm not gonna lie, the first thing I did was skip to the recipes. <laughs> <laughs> he did. But I really wanted to point out that on page 68 and 69 here, there's this whole thing that is literally the health span habits that outlines and kind of summarizes the 10 things that you guys are recommending that people implement. Because I think everybody, I think when I read Eat to Live, I wanted to skip to the end to be like, okay, what's the plan you want me to follow? You know, and there's a lot of science and stuff in there. Um, but I would encourage reading through that, but know that after, once you get through it, then reading those 10 um, habits is just gonna, it's just gonna all click right? It's just going to all come together and all the science that you read, even if you didn't understand all of it 100% the first time you read it, it's all going to come together and it's going to make sense. So yeah. You want to get to the questions? Yeah. He's always trying to rush me along. It's fine. And, and it is top, what it is. And on top of that, just, just to reinforce what you're saying, Jessica, on the health span ha habits, you know, we, we, we divided them up, but the most important thing everyone needs to start with before you even pick up the book, when, just before when you're getting ready to read the book, is the idea that you're broken and that you, you know, that doesn't mean that you're not overweight. That doesn't mean that you don't have certain illnesses. But if you start with the idea that you're broken and that you need to be fixed, um, it's a very, very different place than looking at it more in a holistic way that Juliana and I do, where we say, um, really what we're talking about is you just have some, you're just out of step. Society is out of step with evolutionary norms. We evolved in a world that was very different than the world we live in today. And it's not unreasonable that those things that were survival mechanisms in our evolutionary past have become maladaptive in our problems today. And so once you absolutely disengage and that's what those all those health span habits are about is about sort of realigning your life 
in a way that works synergistically with our evolutionary past. And and if you just if everyone just starts right now and just says, okay, uh, I, I'm not broken. That doesn't mean that there's not some things wrong. That doesn't mean everything's in my control and you're not going to live forever eating carrots. But if you just start from that concept and say, what can I do to incrementally move myself from where I was to where I am? And I think you two represent this because you had far, so far to go and you went to a certain level and now you want to go to a, another level. And as you're doing this, each time you start learning it in a new way. You know, not everybody, not all of our clients have that far to go. Some of them only have 20 or 30 pounds to go. And even for us, the last five or 10 or 12 pounds is just as difficult as the first. I know I was once at 250. And of course, I didn't get to where you guys got, but just that first part. So I, when you read those health span habits, I want everyone to read them with a mindset and an assumption that you're just in a biological mismatch. And if, if I, I hope that helps frame everything we talk about today, because if you make these changes and you stick to them, you will get the same results we got. You'll get the same results that Brian and Jessica have, have gotten so far. And hundreds of other people we've watched uh, uh, see the same results. I, I just, I think, what is your, your line as always? Results are typical. That's right. So. I love that. Nice. I like That's that. That's awesome. All right. You ready for questions? Yes. Okay. So the first one uh, that I have is, what is a health span? And <laughs> what is the solution? <laughs> what a good question. Well... Okay, so we say that, you know, we don't want to just live long, right? We don't want to just get old. And then what we've been doing, we've been extending lifespan, you know, with, you know, prolonged better medical care, you know, more procedures, more pills, more of those things so that we could extend lifespan. But we want to look at living longer, not just living longer. We want to have vitality and energy and feel good and stave off chronic illness. And that's what health span is all about. The research is looking at how well you live, how long you live well. So like ultimately, you know, you want to just live great, feel good, and then go to sleep and it's over, you know, live long and die fast. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the best. That's one of the things in the book I actually highlighted that that the live long and die fast. I like that. Yeah. And, and then the solution, <laughs> well, we all know now, or maybe some of you don't know, that diet is the number one cause of early death and disability in the entire world now. First, it was the United States. We were kind of like, you know, first number one in that. And now we're it's, number one. Uh, yeah. Woohoo. <laughs> Certain things you don't want to be number one in. And now it's around the world. So more so than smoking. So basically the number one thing you can do for your health, your health span, to feel good, to have all that stuff we're talking about, to stave off chronic disease, is to eat healthfully. So that, what does that mean? So we say that it, looking at the evidence, it means eating a diet based on vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices, and tasty combinations of soups, salads, sides, and sweets. And beyond that, what you'll see with the health span habits is, yeah, moving more, you know, being active, but not necessarily hardcore exercise, you know, getting good sleep, all these lifestyle things that all come together. But ultimately, the most important thing, the most important control that you have over your health is what you eat. You know, you are quite literally what you eat. When you put something in your mouth, your cells become you know, they're made from the food and the product, the byproducts, all that whole process that happens in the body. It is so gorgeous. If you think about how we are you know, intertwined and connected to nature and all of that, we are what we eat. And we do it so frequently that it really, really matters. And it's the most important thing you can do to, to make a difference in your health. Awesome. Nice. I love that. That's I'm, great. I'm getting kind of geeked out here because I'm like, I'm super excited for our audience to see this because yeah. it's, it's going to be they're so they're used on our channel it's just us rambling and and you are so eloquently saying stuff that we <laughs> wish we could say but we're just like you know we ramble about it for 20 minutes and then people are like wait what did they say <laughs> oh um, we ramble so, too yeah so i'm excited <laughs> no, i'm excited chance. i'm excited for people to see this and get get to see you know coming from a different perspective um but i will go on with the next question um, so writing this book, I want to know who did what, like, did you, as far as the, when I was reading through the, the beginning part, I was wondering, like, did you guys, 
you know, share 50-50 of the writing? Did you guys write it, you know, one of you write more than the other? And then the recipes, how did those sort of come together? Oh, I just, I, I'm going to start because oh, yeah. I just have to say that I've never had a partner like this in my life. And we have such complementary skill sets that it's so exciting to work with someone like this. Like what I can do really well, you know, he's not really necessarily interested in and vice versa, or, you know, like we just, everything kind of came together. And this is our second book together. We've written a paper together. We've done a lot of work together in the last three and a half years. And um, it's extraordinary because we could finish each other's sentences on paper and in life. And we both like the same kinds of foods and we both like, you know, doing complimentary things in the kitchen. So it was really, I mean, I don't, I don't think we calculated, but it's 50-50 in terms of everything. Like, you know, what I love and what I've studied for 20-something years in nutrition, like the phytonutrients and all that stuff, you know, he has the, he's the he been studying all the health span longevity and circadian stuff. So it was like we put – and I was also – I have all the exercise fitness background as a personal trainer. So, you know, we kind of weaved in our stuff and then we edited our each other and we upped our each other's game. And I, I, it's just been magical to work together. Yeah. And, and for the time – prior to doing this book, the most important thing we did was we were able to uh, really combine our messages. We were both going around the country saying similar <laughs> things, almost identical things. And for you know the couple of years that led up to this book, we had this amazing opportunity not only to coach clients together uh, and write papers together, as Juliana said, documentaries that we were in together, but we had this opportunity to combine those messages. And what was what was great is that it it really, you know, a lot of people throw around the word synergy, but we actually lived it because both of our messages got amplified in a way that I don't think either of us could have imagined. Um, and so it was it was really fun. So, you know, to specifically in terms of the book, um, what we do when we're writing in general is, it, okay, we have a different style of writing. So Juliana <laughs> Juliana is a mechanical writer. She sits down, she composes stuff, she frets over this sentence or that sentence. Look up and, studies, look yeah, up studies. Look, <laughs> and I am, I can carry a lot of facts around in my brain at the same time, especially when I'm focused on something. And so for me, I think about what I'm going to write Um I think about what I'm going to write for a long time, and when I sit down, 3,000 words come out. And nearly in the way, they need to be edited, obviously, but nearly in the same story as you see them when they come out. So that different style was really great. It facilitated, you know, I, you know, we would, we had sections divided up, as, as she was saying, we had these sections divided up, we started, but the concept of, you know, throwing some stuff down or having a conversation and then throwing some stuff down and then passing it over and Juliana, you know, going at it. And then it goes to the editor. And with the editor, you know, they have a whole different idea of what's important and what's not important. They just, you know, bleed all over stuff. So then you have have this horrible situation <laughs> that you have to take sentences out. It's painful. You know, it's, it, it is very painful. And yeah. so that's how the written part went down. But fortunately, if anyone goes, if you want to really read our the paper that's in the Journal of, Geriatic, G Journal of Geriatric um, Cardiology. Cardiology, if you read that article and if you read Oxidative Priority and Metabolic Winter Hypothesis, what you'll find is that most of this stuff is already there. We just made it a little bit more accessible and we hung it on the framework of food in a way you sort of won't in an academic paper. But a lot of the information, a lot of the foundation was there. And one of the things we really wanted to do differently, uh, especially coming out of the Idiot's Guide, where we're not allowed to have references, et cetera. And, you know, people are always throwing references around. I'm not sure how much it, it helps sometimes. But one of the things that we really want to do di differently is that the stuff that we have in this book has all been published first. Now, that doesn't mean because it's published is truth. There's lots of wrong things that are out there. But I felt really you know, proud of the fact that in terms of at least going that next level and not just throwing out another book because I heard something and now I'm writing a book or I lost weight, now I'm writing a book, we went to that next step and all of our new ideas, all the new concepts that are in this book have all been gone through academic peer review. And I think that's at least something. It's a start. 
And it was very important for both of us to do that. Is there something you want to add on no, the, I, that writing process? Yeah, it just it's funny because, you know, I'm like a I'm like I'm like you, Jess, like planner and organizer, like hyper organized. Like I need everything, you know, schedules. I'm, you know, always on time or early and like that stuff makes me crazy. And so Ray would have this, like, I said, we have to write this chapter. And he's like, I know, I know, I got it, I got it. I'm like, oh, and I'm like stressing. I'm like, well, I, I wrote everything I wanted to write. And all, and I'd be like so nervous because it was like do or whatever. And all of a sudden he'd be like, Bleh, you know, like just vomit out gorgeous wisdom onto the page in this perfect format. And he was like, oh, okay, we got exactly what we needed. But it was always like pushing my comfort zone. But, it, you know, it's been like that. We've done presentations together and all sorts of things together. It's, it's just, it's kind of fun, like just the way we work differently. But it worked out. It's been working out and, great. And it was fun in another way because we had to reimagine a lot of things. We had to reimagine a lot of things from how we had been uh, presenting them because they were just limited words. You know, it's the front of a cookbook. And maybe to go one step one step further in the philosophy behind the book for those that haven't read it yet. And we pushed really hard on our editors. Um, we pushed, you know, Anne was just phenomenal in, in dealing with us, but I know she <laughs> was probably freaking out. Keyword is dealing with us. Yeah. But um, one of the things that we believed is that a lot of people will pick up a beautiful, a beautiful cookbook. A lot of people will pick up a beautiful cookbook because uh, they see the the pictures, the photographs, et cetera. And one of the problems Juliana had had in the past is most of her books were sort of presented like cookbooks, but they actually weren't pretty pictures in the back, and people would criticize that. Um, because they weren't technically cookbooks. Right. Well, three out of four weren't technically, but they had they had recipes, but they weren't supposed to be cookbooks, but everyone thought they were going to be a cookbook. So it was kind of like this catch-22. An expectation yeah. issue. And so one of the things we said is, hey, we really want to load the front up with science, but most of the science books are academic tones with a, some recipes in a 12-point point font at the end. And it's like, we really don't want to do that. We want to have science up front and that. And they're like, well, you're going to lose your, your reader. You lose your reader. I said, you know, here's what I believe, and I may be wrong. There will be people that pick this up because of the pictures. And I, I promise you not one person is going to put it back because it's got some big words in the front. I just don't think that's going to happen. I believe in people much more than that. But there are going to be people that pick this up and start reading it. And you guys make that point where they start reading the front and say, holy smokes, this is something very different that I haven't thought about. And if we could just you know, strike that, that compromise and have the technical and the color, whereas all the other books, like Eat to Live and some of the other great books that I read in the past, all had really great technical messages, but they're just, you know, there wasn't that beauty of it. And I wanted it to be approachable and for someone to pick it up and stumble in to these other stories that were up front. So when you guys first said that to us, uh, in fact, you didn't say it to us, it was <laughs> recorded on the, on the, the cheese, cheese video, sauce, you yeah. know, before we even met, you couldn't have said something no. more complimentary because we, were, that's we had the, chills. We were so happy. It's yeah. like, yeah, we felt heard. It was so great. Yeah, it was the debate we had with our publishers and what you proved was that we were right, which is, I love that, at least with two people. And that's all that matters at this point. I want to take yes for an answer. <laughs> yeah, all, all of it matters is what we think, obviously. Uh, yeah. Obviously. <laughs> I, I love I love what you guys say there. Like, well, going, going back to how you complement each other's skill sets, that's why this whole channel has worked for us. Because yeah. we, and we've been married for eight years and we just realized, oh, by the way, we have like, the, you know, we, I have a skill set that I love doing certain things and he hates doing other things. And so it's actually why our channel has worked out so well, um, because we're able to complement each other's skill sets in doing a project. So I think yeah. anytime you can, you can find someone to do a project with like that, it's going to make a huge difference. Um, but yeah, this book, I mean, I th I love what you said about the book being a balance of the, the pictures. Cause I, I've read some of these other books and I know exactly what you're talking about when you talk about these other books and it's the balance of being, you know, you got to have the flashy, but you also got to have the information and getting that balance. You got, I think you guys have done that perfectly. We yeah. eat with our yeah. eyes first. I mean, that's yeah. so important. And, 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 and I was just going to say, and uh, I could tell even, even before I read the, the, you know, first part of the book, when I was literally just going through the recipes, like I could see just like how well put together it was 
that it wasn't just like, you know, me putting together a recipe because a lot of my stuff is, is like, you know, I, I, I don't know, like I don't know a lot about uh, the actual cooking process because I just cook for myself and I've never actually been trained in anything. And so for me to actually look at the recipes though and to see like, okay, I see why this is here. I see why this is here. I see why this is here. And everything just works together. And I was just like, man, like this is just such a well put together and well thought out and well balanced recipes that I was like, this is, this is absolutely stuff that I wanna make. And it doesn't look like the recipes in a lot of these other books that I have come across. Like, I mean, we, you talk about the eat to live, like cookbook and stuff like that. These recipes don't look anything like those recipes. And I love that. That is just absolutely so, amazing to me. So what I'm, he what I'm hearing is, so people always ask us to make a cookbook. And what I'm hearing is basically we shouldn't because they already made the best one. So. <laughs> no, no, it, that is not, not what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not that, but here's the, here's the part, Brian, that's I think important in what you're saying is that you know, well, even in our case, when we would, you ask also to go back to Jessica's second part of her question, how do we go about doing that? So we divided um, the cookbook into the soups, salads, sides, and sweets. We wanted to uh, really give some framework because things like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, for those that haven't read it, these kinds of meals really cause us to stumble. They're great for a restaurant to know what time, what to serve you at this time of day so they can be prepared, but they really have nothing to do with human biology and what tastes good. You know, it doesn't matter if you eat chili in the morning. It doesn't matter if you eat pancakes at night. It really just doesn't matter what time of day you eat these things. Um, what matters more is what you're eating, and that's what the book was concerned with. And so once we get rid of that, once we get rid of protein, carbs, and fat, um, one of the things that we tried to do was really use the things that we have in our pantry every single day, the things that we cook with every single day. For example, you're going to find there's cashews used as the base for so many recipes. Those are our primary fats. For dressings fats. and sauces. For yeah. dressings and sauces. Those are our primary fats, fat um, uh, sources that are that are in there with to avoid using the uh, excess oils. And, you know, our taster, honestly was getting upset because so many of our recipes had these common ingredients. Cashews, romaine, she was talking about romaine. I yeah. totally get it, totally right. get and, that. But we were thinking like, I think you guys think, and saying, you know, having a little repetition as long as the whole flavor profile is different, it's like every single, every single recipe doesn't need to be the next gourmet recipe. Some of these recipes need to be the ones that use common ingredients because that was the biggest problem I had mm -hmm. when I went plant-based was I, I loved to cook and I loved side dishes. So it wasn't that, but it was just the, it was just looking in my pantry and saying, Oh no, what am I going to eat? Now I know that it was just as easy as today and I can find everything delicious to eat. But the first two months, folks, I'm just telling you, it sucked for me. It was, it was not very fun. And it, and I hadn't, and that was way before, the whole potato thing started. So I'm just telling you <laughs> that it was really not a good thing because I just didn't know what to make. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally can understand that. Definitely yeah. Relate can relate. To that. Our, if you guys could see our first grocery store shopping, well, first of all, it was on the last day that we were eating potatoes and we were delirious. But um, <laughs> if you could see us walking through the grocery store trying to figure out what to buy, it was the most, it was, it was hilarious. So yeah. if you go to Instagram, right now to Ray Cronice and you go to, uh, let's see, what's the date here? If you go to, uh, I posted it on, it looks like November 23rd, 2019, which was my 10 year anniversary. Um, oh, my wow. shopping list is on there. I'm going there so, right now. <laughs> you know, it's on there. So, so you will see that I bought, you know, 21.5 pounds of vegetables. Um, that was the very first day of my plant-based diet, November 23rd, 2009. It happened to be the Monday before Thanksgiving. I started before Thanksgiving, not after. That's why we call him Cray Ray. Yeah. At least one of the reasons. $51.97. Did you eat it all? I did. All those pounds. I did. But that was what I bought the very first week that I started this crazy thing. And I said, okay, for next year, this is what I'm going to eat. I'm going to figure out how to make it work and I'm not going to change. And here we are. In I, 2020, I so love that, I mean, the it's, it's crazy. Uh, I love the prices on there. I love how detailed it is. 
Um, the, the, if you actually go back on our Instagram <laughs> to the very beginning, you'll just see a bunch of potatoes. Um, and so people who found us and didn't know anything about our potato stuff will go back through those Instagram photos and comment and be like, wait, why are you eating so many potatoes? I'll be like, just, just watch a few videos. Uh, so, you know, Ray, you love to cook and you have training, right? Uh, as, as a professional chef. Uh, uh, but do you have any favorite SOS free seasonings that you actually like to use? And this is, this is a question from, from the, the gallery. So, yeah. So I love Dax. That's the brand. If I were going to invent seasonings, I would invent, invent Dax seasonings. I love Dax. Um, I think all of their flavor combinations, I feel like they nailed it. Um, I eventually want to do some seasonings, but I just think Dax really did a great job and they're, they have a lot of different flavors. Um, let's see, SOS. So we really don't use that concept. And one of the things we talk about in the book is the difference between cooking with oil and using oil in a culinary sense. So maybe this is a time to bring that up. So in order to not be, you know, I don't even like SOS implies panic. Okay, I don't like fear and food. I don't don't like food villains. That's just my style. I understand why people do it, and maybe I, I totally it's agree for a lot of people. It's just not helpful for me. Yeah. So you know, so here's what I call cooking with oil. Cooking with oil is grabbing a bottle of olive oil before you even know what's going in the pan, right? And you start drenching stuff, and you start doing all these things that aren't necessary. Using oil in a culinary sense, as we describe in the book is a way to use it to get that natural oily feeling that has certain flavors that develop. And there's a way to do that in such a way that you're not using a calorically significant amount. So what's culinarily significant is different than what's, what's um, uh, calorically significant. And so, and this is not just playing the stupid tricks that they do with bottles, fat-free, you know, quarter of a second, you know, blast or whatever, third of a second. So I'm not talking about that so much. I'm talking about the idea of, of really using it in a positive way. So with that out of the way, the other thing, let's see, we love, well, see, we love nuts and seeds, and some of those people are for that, and some of them are anti-nut and seeds, I don't know. But we, we use nuts. We use an ounce to an ounce and a half of nuts every day in some set sauce and dressing. So that's one of our techniques that we use so you can get the best of both worlds. You're measuring the nut, but you're not. Um, we like when we're adding salty. So let's talk about sweet, salty, oily, not sugar, salt, and oil, right? So we like getting sweet, I mean, salty flavors with tamari because it has the rich umami flavors. We like miso, but we don't overuse it. So it's not like, you know, a half cup of miso. So why not put the salt in there? Because a lot of people do this, right? A lot of people... Um, disguise that they're not using sugar, oil, and salt by putting sweet, salty, and oily crap in their food, right? So w we try to balance or blend that. What are some other things that we do that are... Well, for sweet, you know, we go with all, these are all, the cool thing is we've translated the science into practical tips in the kitchen because the ounce of nuts and seeds, because we want to have, we want to have one to two ounces of nuts and seeds a day nutritionally speaking, to get all the L-arginine and the, you know, the vitamin E and phytosterols, all those wonderful things that you could only get from nuts or concentrated in nuts. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of science, there's science behind everything we're saying. And so that's one thing. And then in terms of salty, yeah, we'll use like the tamari or the miso, uh, but we're also still trying to maintain the numbers, like to, to stay under 1500 milligrams a day. And we don't, uh, we don't recommend anyone count anything because it's just, we, you don't need to count. And we did all the counting for you, <laughs> you know, because we don't we don't even really care about portion size. It just depends on it. We're trying to make it very easy from a sweet perspective. We also stick to like the World Health Organization guidelines. Everyone's guidelines are basically under 10 percent of your calories from added sugars. And so in that we use maybe sometimes we used a little bit of maple syrup. We used a little bit of black sap blackstrap molasses. We didn't whip out the white sugar, any coconut sugar, any of that stuff. We, we got them from wholeer fruits or we do a dates, you know, dates sometimes mm -hmm. or fruits. Like all of our whole sweet section, there's no, it's not baked goods, it's not cookies and cakes and stuff. It's like fruit-based 
right. delicious dishes. But so we, we were mindful of all of the regulations and what the recommendations are for a health span diet and what we, what we advise. And we kind of translated that into how do you put that into use without sacrificing flavor. Like you could easily go in there and just, you know, eat very, very plain and do really well. But you don't have to go totally extreme. You can't. There is a way to use these in a strategic way. Right. And, and another thing on this point. So when you use something like molasses to sweeten or tamari to add salty, right? These things have other flavors. And so they naturally limit because you can only put so much molasses in a recipe before it just tastes like molasses. It's such a strong kind of flavor. And we got criticized for it, which was really interesting in some sense, but the criticism just reinforced our point, which is, you know, we don't really need it any sweeter than this. It's sweet enough. And if you add more molasses, it's just going to taste like molasses. Maple syrup is another one. You know, it's used a lot. Obviously, maple syrup and molasses are sugar. And sugar itself isn't the problem. The problem is the stuff we make with sugar. And that stuff is loaded, and it's a it's a, a completely different discussion. Or, or how much you're using, right. you know. And this is the same thing with maple syrup. After a while maple syrup ends up flavoring it like maple syrup and it no longer tastes like this. So the advantage in cooking of using refined sugar is I can bring up the sweetness without changing the flavor palette that's down there, Brian. So this answers your question on how we come about in these structures. The advantage of salt is that I can bring up salty flavor without changing the fundamental palate. So it turns out it's a little bit more difficult when you're doing it with things like um, tamari or miso or dates, et cetera, because the characteristics of those things limit how much you have. But we saw that as a, an advantage, not a disadvantage. We saw that as limiting these things naturally. And it worked out that you know what we would end up doing is we'd come up with recipes we would go to the grocery store and grab all the stuff we need. We'd, we'd make that first recipe, try it. You know, how can we change it? Every single recipe in this book, we made more than one time. A, a taster made it as well. Sometimes a tester, they made it as well. And then they fed back to us information. So each one has been, they weren't just jotted down. They, they, we went through those. And so I think that makes a difference. Yeah, that was my first time doing that I this in the fifth book now uh, this is the first time I had a tester like an official tester I had people testing it last time and it's also the first time I worked with an actual professionally trained chef so <laughs> I think it kind of took stuff to another level in my opinion it was fun to, we, yeah. it was fun because we loved doing it I yeah. mean it was really it wasn't you know there were some moments of tense <laughs> you know kitchen te intensity that, you, that we, if we had on there and oh and little wars about speaking, oil and, uh, yeah speaking of yeah. oil <laughs> yeah, you, so, would have, you would you would die if you could have seen so we were listening to the podcast you guys did where you mentioned using some oil in some of the recipes and um it, i don't know what it was probably like one in the morning or something crazy when we were listening to this and we were both we were both just acting out like oh we can't associate with these people anymore. They're using oil in their in their recipes. We're not <laughs> we're like turn it off, cancel the Q and A. We're not doing this. This is not. This is this is done. <laughs> we obviously were joking because we're. But I think people. I think that yeah. just that kind of. My point is, it's just people get so hard lined about it, but for what reason they don't necessarily yes. understand. Yeah. And so it just it, it's it's interesting to me that you guys have pushed those boundaries a little bit. So. Yeah, so let's give it let's give everybody some science on this right now. And this is all you need to know about oil and salt, okay, to and cooking vegetables. This is in one little fail swoops, Juliana. Okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready. I know. What do so you say? So here's the deal. <laughs> here's the deal. You cook your vegetable with water. That's what you cook with. You cook with water. And when you cook with water, you maintain the maximum amount of hydration in that vegetable. Then, after that vegetable is cooked, if it's going to be something that's a culinary significant oil, and I'm going to give an example, we just did a stir fry. A stir fry has all these vegetables. They were all done in a wok that's seasoned. It was seasoned with oil, but there's no oil left in there. You know, it's, it's seasoned. 
And so you've cooked it, nothing's sticking. I'm using water. I'm doing water sauteing techniques just like everybody else would imagine. Now I'm going to now reverse this whole process and we're going to add the garlic at the end instead of the beginning. I would have always grabbed the bottle of oil, put it in the bottom of the pan, put the garlic and onions in. Has everybody got this you know, down? That's how we would have done it. But today we do something different. I have pull the vegetables aside. I put about a teaspoon, no more than a tablespoon, but probably a teaspoon in the center of the pan. And then I put the garlic in there at the end of cooking, not in the beginning, because garlic only needs about 30 seconds. Now, this is sesame oil. Sesame oil has this wonderful, aromatic, pungent, amazing flavor that adds to all Asian cooking, and it's critical in the flavor. You can use a chili sesame oil if you want, if you want it a little bit more spicy. So now that garlic is sauteing, and now what we do is we toss, toss that newly sauteed garlic, which the kitchen is now smelling great. It Now the oil covers the outside of the vegetable, and because it wasn't cooked in oil, it's sitting on the outside. And that oil doesn't mix with the water, so it just sits on the outside. I mean, if you want to get it off your hands, if you have it on your hands, then, you know, that's it. So now, after that, what we end up doing is we use a little bit of tamari, which is the salt, it's the salt form. Now, the vegetables are covered in oil, just a thin film, but they're coated in that oil. And now salt and water doesn't dissolve in oil. So the so the, now the now the the tamari that you're putting on the surface of this thing is sitting right there and it's going to hit your tongue first. So like a potato chip and a and bread, a serving of bread, have the same amount of sodium in. One of them's cooked in, one of them you've dehydrated the potato, backfilled it with oil, and now the salt doesn't dissolve so it hits your tongue first. That's why potato chips taste salty. But we've just used this science in the right way. So tastes perfectly oily like you would imagine an Asian stir fry to do, but in a positive way, not in an excessive way. Great sesame flavor, great garlic flavor, because the garlic gets carried up and caramelized in a different way when you protect its surface from oxidation with by coating it with that oil. It all gets on there, and then the little spit of so soy sauce that you lose is right on the top, so it hits your tongue first. So as you're having that stir fry, and in that moment, if you just look at it that way scientifically and break it down bit by bit, this is how we formed our recipes. And all of them work with the same basic idea. Cook with water, a little bit of oil next, and then the salt. Go ahead. That said, I think there's only five recipes out of 100 plus recipes that actually have right. a little bit of oil. That said, because it was a war, I didn't want any. But I see I've tasted the difference and we have our clients kind of experiment with this on our program because it is significantly different. So it's just kind of it's nice to have the option and we explain why. Um, but not all the rest. Most recipes don't. We don't even use any oil. Yeah. 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 No, it, we only use it when it when it's for a reason. And, and, I'll, and I'll give you an example where I won the fight. You can ask her about the Cape Cod. Salad. Oh, so tell them that story. Oh. <sighs> He had this salad recipe that he knew when he used to go to Cape Cod. And he, he loved this recipe. He used to make it all the time, blah, blah, blah. So he made it for me. And I'm like, eh, doesn't sound good. It's like fruit. Like we divided the recipes, by the way, in terms of what we like. Like I didn't do many of the sweet recipes because I don't like anything sweet anymore. But this one recipe, it had like raisins and it was like this weird mix of salad. I'm like, it's okay. You could, you just make it however you want. And he's like, but there's, you know, there's going to be this little olive oil. I'm like, why do you need olive oil? Like, I just didn't make sense to me. It was just like this crazy recipe. So he makes it and I'm like, he's like, just have one bite. I'm like, I don't want it. It's okay. I trust you. He's like, no, no, have a bite. I'm like, Ugh. I ate the whole thing. <laughs> it was the best salad ever. And actually, now I make him make it for me. So, And I made it myself. And, and we made it with and without oil. It was so and balanced. It's, just one, te it's yeah. one teaspoon of robust olive oil. And for a huge yeah, amount of Yeah, I salad. have a four ounce. Before we get off, I'll get this. I have a four ounce <laughs> bottle of olive oil in my pantry. And I never use it all. I throw it away because I now know what it smells like when it's rancid. What I, I didn't know that before I ate this way. You know, when I had the big bottle and glug, 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 like everybody else, what they think we're doing, um, I wouldn't know that. But now I never even use a four ounce bottle. And so if you're not using, if you're cooking every day, which I do, and you're not using a four ounce bottle over a month time, then this is not a problem. 
but you get a hundred percent, you know, it's like the parable of the orange. Have you, have you guys heard the parable of the orange? Uh, I have not. No, sorry. <laughs> so you can edit this out if you don't want it in here, but you know, the two ladies that go down to the corner store and it's coronavirus time, right? So they both go down because they needed an orange and the, there was only one orange left and the, and the shopkeeper, knowing they were both really great, comp, uh, great customers said, listen, listen, uh, the, you know, the, the, I'm so sorry that I only have one orange. Please, please let me just give this to you. So he goes to the front, he cuts it in half, and he gives them both the half the orange. And the you know, first lady goes up and she sits down and she's, you know, peeling the orange and eating the orange and and watching watching her favorite show. And the second uh, lady goes up and she gets out her zester and starts zesting the orange, and she's making some orange muffins. And the moral of the story is, is had they just communicated, they both could have had 100% of the orange. And what we're trying to do with our book is do just <laughs> that. We want to have 100% of the orange. That's what our goal is. And there's no reason to create these false dichotomies, these false extremes, because I don't care who you are. You're not going to escape sugar. You're not going to escape fat. You know, you're not going to escape sodium. But there are ways to eat it in ways that are culinarily significant and make your food taste delicious and enjoyable. And nutritionally still sound. Exactly. Yeah. And that is that is our goal with doing this. And this is where, when I told you about synergy, her pushing, me pushing, made us focus that on the right thing. Because she would have gone with the easy way of just keep letting, just Taking it all out. Yeah. And I never I had oil the, in a single recipe up right. until I met this guy. Yeah. And I would have gone the other way. <laughs> he ruined me. <laughs> I, I would have gone the other way and probably had a little bit in on everyone. Not that either one of those ways matters, but the but the but coming together and having those compromises and that's where the best creativity comes, you know, because now she's not just you know, humoring me with the idea that this makes a huge flavor difference. She absolutely knows that it makes a difference. And when we eat that way, she enjoys it and it doesn't, that, doesn't it sounds exactly anymore. like when Brian and I make a YouTube video. Yep. I he, he wants, he has his vision for how it's going to be. <laughs> and then I come in and I'm like, but we should do this. We should do that. <laughs> my brain is still even processing. Like we have so many questions that we could totally also, ask right now. It's like, I just want to come over for stir fry. Really? <laughs> I Let's know do you have to. <laughs> We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. We'll do. We'll do. I'll make a commitment that we'll at least at one time come to uh, <gasps> St. Louis and do like we'll do a worldwide stir fry. Everybody can go out and get the ingredients. <laughs> you know, it would be oh, great we'll if you guys were in the kitchen. I like that because you'd be in. If this is like a famous yeah, movie set exactly. here, you know, like a film set. This is like. You're, you're I know. Right. This, this will be. You'll have to take pictures when you come here. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to ask you guys about your routine and sort of productivity. So we're in this weird time right now where everyone's at home, right? Everyone's stuck at home. And I feel like this should be a time where everyone is reevaluating their lives and their priorities and trying to figure out, you know, working on these projects that they have that they've been meaning to do for years but have never you know, come to fruition and myself included, I have so many, I have so many ideas going on in my head for the channel, for other stuff. So how do you, how do you stay productive in like, you know, work from home environment? Cause I'm assuming you guys work. I mean, you work from home all the time. So how do you stay productive? Yeah, nothing about our routine has really changed except that I was unable to go home and see my children. <laughs> but other than that, like when I'm here, this is what we do. Like we are we are constantly working and um, we don't go out for days. So that's totally typical. Uh, but my advice, my advice would be to make a schedule. It is hard. I mean, it's hard to motivate, especially with all of the crazy drama out there. And it's hard to stay focused. Like I'm watch I keep falling finding myself, you know, getting sucked into the news and the drama and the, the worry and all that too. And I know a lot of people are, are experiencing that. There's a lot of increase in anxiety and depression, a lot of stuff that's happening. So it's, it's not, this is not normal. No one has ever been through this before. And we're all kind of going through this and navigating it together. That said, technically speaking, 
the way to help move forward and be more proactive in terms of getting things done and increasing productivity would be to, to have a schedule and to stick to your schedule. You know, wake up at the same time every day, go to bed at the same time every day, you know, do your workouts. So that, like have a schedule that you're going to continue sticking with no matter what. Um, it's hard to do right now. I'm, I'm saying this. I'm not saying I'm doing it perfectly at all. Yeah. We're sucking at that. Yeah, I, I think most people are. Most people aren't. Our, our sleep schedule is like, it's, it's non-existent at this point. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've, everyone I've spoken to, it's the same thing. But if Brian woke up at noon today. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was back to my, I, uh, well, back I'm, to my early college days. Like yeah, that. It is. I had my highlighter. I was up at 7 a.m. with my highlighter ready to go, but he was, you <laughs> and, know. And that's important. So one of the other advantages of working at home, having done the corporate government thing for 20 years prior to that, is the idea that you do get to make your own schedule. Um, for me, the most important thing is I do the turn it off. So I don't do email in the morning. I focus 100% on our clients in the morning, so that's the very first thing I do. I do some things that are normally, I, I reverse the schedule, meaning I sort of have brain time in the morning where I just watch something interesting, do some research on something, read something. Uh, it's never news, it's never those kinds of things. And then the middle of our day is where we're both kind of on the same schedule, where we both are really firing on all cylinders. A lot of times it's around client calls or creating content or doing those things. And then towards the end of the day, I tend to just fade off. And Juliana, her brain is just just kicking into high gear you know, later at night. And going with that schedule matters. So the really great thing is we both end up getting, interestingly, kind of a line, a, a lone time um, where I have kind of a lone time in the morning. She has a lone time in the evening. And then in the middle, we're working productively on stuff and doing things. But the most important thing is don't let the whack-a-mole email, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, pick the time when you're going to do those things and have a blast, have fun. Don't let anybody interrupt your Twitter time. Don't let anybody interrupt whatever you want to do, Tom. I'd tell everybody to turn the news off. But other than that, I would say do that. If you're going to do music, do some music. Do If you've got some podcasts you want to listen to, do that. Don't let anybody interrupt those things. And then find those times where you're going to respond to emails, respond to texts, respond to the non-critical things. Because if you let somebody every single day, they will become, their priorities will become your priorities and you'll never get anything done. Every single day you wake up saying, I'm going to do this. And every single day you go to bed thinking, oh my gosh, I did all these things for everybody else, but I didn't do the things that were on my list. So that's what I would put in. So I heard that you don't have a TV, Ray. Is this true? It's actually not technically too true. I actually have two or three <laughs> TVs. I just don't have the remote control to turn them on. <laughs> There's a real big difference. But no, I, I don't watch TV at all. I, I just don't. I have a really hard time, like about... 30 minutes is sort of my max time, and then I'm bored and I, I can't stand to sit there and watch it. So it's more of a boredom thing, it's, is, or is it, is it more of like a productivity getting sucked? I feel like right now everybody is out it's there mind rot. watching. That's yeah. what it is. They're, it's yeah. mind rot. Yeah. It's mind rot. Even the stuff that everybody thinks is funny, et cetera, to me, it's all mind rot. I just like I could just think of a thousand more things that I would rather fill my mind with than this stuff. And then what everybody does is they say, oh, ha, 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 I'm laughing at their situation and it doesn't affect me, but it does. It gets in your little earworms. You start thinking about it. And I just choose to see the world way more optimistically. I think we are going to do way better than everybody thinks. And I get tired of everything being negative or somebody else's whatever. I don't care what anybody does. Um, from I don't do politics, but I don't care about anybody's lifestyle or their religion or whatever. Nothing, I don't really involve myself in other people's stuff. And so whatever someone wants to do is fine. However, I just feel like, you know, people are overly voyeuristic. Maybe that's why we're able to do what we're doing now. But I, I just think most TV is mind rot. I, that just, I mean, I hate that. You know, I gave up sports in 1983 uh, because I was going into my undergraduate degree and I was ill-prepared. Um, and I just didn't have the time. This was in the day of ABC Wide World of Sports for our older folks out there, you know, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And it was just, I just didn't have time to watch sports anymore. 
Hmm. Crazy. So uh, I know it's funny, uh, but there are actually up in studies and people uh, who don't have TVs in their house generally actually view the world more optimistically than those who do ah. have TVs. Yeah. So still, it's probably one of those weird like college studies, you know, but still, I'm just saying, yeah. I've read it. You yeah, go. if you're gonna binge watch, if you're gonna binge something, binge listen to Science and Sorcery, or binge watch Actually, Crocs YouTube, in the Kitchen. That's right. Yeah, YouTube exactly. YouTube in general, even <laughs> even the off color crazy stuff on YouTube to me is way more entertaining. I'd rather see somebody's conspiracy theory stuff and watch that as fiction than the stuff that I see on most TV. But I sometimes, just, sometimes I could convince because I I don't have the same beliefs. Although I am more negative, so <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I do like you just proved yourself wrong. I know. No, but in terms of I, I still will let my brain rot sometimes. Like it's yeah. nice to just veg out a little bit because yeah. I'm so always on and always it's very my life is very intense, I think. So I like to have time to just bleh, and I don't do that while I'm here. So right, when she I'm, really doesn't. When I, go, I, I like that. I like that show OA when it was out. Oh, yeah. I got so I was going to say, I've, I've been able to convince him or to get him into like one show, the OA. And before um, that, it was Seinfeld and Friends. That's the other. Yeah. Only well, other that thing. was before I, I even knew I know, you. No, but that's and what then, I watched before. And then we'll watch like documentaries. Like I've learned a lot about different things um, from documentaries because he has to. I love to documentaries. Yeah. So yeah, it's one of my my primary forms of entertainment yeah. is documentaries. So uh so you, we were talking about productivity and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, do you guys actually plan out your meals and uh, or do you just wing it? <laughs> That's me. Also, I, I am a big grocery. Everybody who watches our channel knows that I do like I have a, a, a grocery list document that I print out like I edit it before I go to the store. I've even gone so far as making the list in the order of the in, in, of the store yes! so that I can get it. You know, so so I have I have a system for everything. Everything. So I'm curious to know if that translates with you guys. You're you are my soul sister. I yeah. swear we have so much in common, <laughs> Jessica. It's so funny. But okay, yeah, I'm big time list plan. I want to know what I'm eating when she I'm is eating. Also an impulsive shopper too. She never gets out of the store with the stuff on her list. She always finds some other deal. You know it. Hey. So you are her, like hey. her pantry is a grocery store. It is. It is. I'm it's proud true. of it. And actually, who's laughing now, right? I have in my little apartment that's a million <laughs> miles away from here is stocked filled with these beautiful <laughs> beans that I can't. I know. People I know. I'm not going to tell anyone where food. I live. I know. I know. <laughs> you know where I live in uh, downtown L.A. Um, do you have toilet paper there, though? I, that's the most she important. Does. We have, I'm saving we have, it for um, when we run out here and there's no, I'm going to fly home just for that. Yeah, this, my beans uh, and my toilet paper bi in that order. This bi-coastal <laughs> thing is really great because we See? have in both of our places we have all of what we need. So. Yeah, yeah. But I am a big time planner and I write the list and then he he likes to go to the stores more than I do, especially now. Like I just, I don't love going to the stores um, anymore so, because I don't have to. So like I'll give him the list. Yeah, so our, our system, the way it works is as I'm usually the one cooking just because well, I enjoy cooking Because he won't let me cook. Let's just yeah. put it that way. Like he will not let but me cook. tell him why. Well, I've never had anyone cook for me ever. Like maybe my mom-ish, you know, for a few years. But um, but this is the first time where he like gets excited to feed me, and it's incredible. And like he knows exactly what I like, and he's a really good chef. So I'm not complaining per it. se. So I always bark out the things that we're getting low on, and she'll occasionally have some other things to add. And so I put it on my list in well, order, Jessica, of right. where it is in the store. Too. And so then when I, I get that. when I get in the car, I usually get a text that has all the things that are on the list that we've accumulated. Um, and then I go in and I'm typically doing the Brian thing where, you know, how you guys had the challenge in the box. That's just how we live our life, which is the box is just bigger. It's our pantry and a refrigerator. And I love to go in there and, you know, put two things together that no one's put together before. You and know? some so of the best meals come out like that. Like, honestly, we, Brian, I keep thinking about those burgers you made. Like, I want to try that with yeah. the, the mustard, nutritional yeast, corn sauce. Oh, my God. Yeah. That yeah. looks so good. Yeah. So Yeah, it was... I was still eating that for... Actually, I think I finished it finally yesterday because we, we had some leftover and it, it was still great yeah. <laughs> even after all that time. So, so it's really great. We have our... I would say, typically, we have about five to seven prime recipes that rotate every month or so, like we'll get into a phase of this, but 
it's always the stuff you see in the book. So it's soups outside or sweet. So we have soups. We do soups probably less frequently than other things. Well, because I love salad. She loves salad. Like, I could eat salad every single so, day. So I, I love making the salads and creating really cool dressings. So that's what we have fun with. Um, and then we do a lot of different side dishes. Like yesterday, she was wanting to do a salad, and I needed to use up some kimchi. So I did our kimchi rolls, which will be from our new book. Um, but kimchi rolls that were just phenomenal. But then I wanted him sauce. to do a deconstructed version of it into salad so he could have my salad and the kimchi rolls at the same time. And so he did. So she got that too. It was so good. So yeah. But we do it that way, um, Jessica. We we sort of divide up. I'm kind of the hunter-gatherer when it comes to, <laughs> I go gather vegetables. I love to shop. I love the grocery store. He does. Like he could spend hours. It's so funny because I thought I was like that until I met him. Like he spends hours. He gets so excited. It's It's really fun. It's actually, it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I could spend I can spend my whole life in a grocery store. Brian stopped going with me a long time ago because he he gave up on me. I'm I all, hate stores. I'm always like sitting there comparing prices and like I'll get my calculator out on my phone. Like, is this you know it, what with with everything that I buy? So he gets really annoyed with so me. Shopping is like a living hell for me. <laughs> for wow. us, it's go to the produce section, go grab the nuts and seeds. Uh, and then a few things. Tip, the typically, rest of the store. A, typically a small amount, like spices, or whatever, and then we're out. You know, it's really, we really go to the produce section in and out. I mean, that's what we primarily get, and you know, the starchy vegetables. And then we also go to an Asian store. So oh, if yeah. you haven't discovered an Asian store and you're on a plant based diet, just stay away from all the sauces and all. Well, the Well, that's where we stuff. find our low sodium tamari right. only there. Right. But yeah, but, but the vegetables amazing are produce. just all kinds of really Mushrooms. amazing fruits and vegetables and stuff that are great. Daikon radish, mm. my favorite. So, okay, I already kind of know the answer to this, I think, but how many times a day do each of you eat? I want like both of your perspectives on that. Yeah, so I would say I typically eat once a day unless she's here. So, um, and the reason why is for me, and this will be true of probably a lot of people watching, um, I don't have an off switch. So once I turn it on, I tend to want to eat more. So for me, um, the way I deal with eating enough or not eating, overeating, is that I just eat later in the day and then I have that one amazing meal, but I don't snack at all. I, so I, I don't have a tendency to snack or I don't let myself snack. I just don't need that. And then when I eat, I eat a volume of food. I eat what I'm, you know, a nice meal. And then normally I'm done for the day. I would say occasionally once twice a week maybe not that often but but at least once or two, i would say you know just to put it up there i'll i'll have i'll be hungry one more time later and that typically will be like frozen fruit i'll usually get the mixed berry stuff out heat that up etc when she's here we eat earlier and when i eat that meal i tend to want another meal like it when i would normally eat at five to seven o'clock is that fair mm-hmm yeah. Well, I don't know what you do when I'm not here. When I'm not, when I'm in LA, I will usually eat one meal, sometimes two uh, also, but also within a narrow window. And when I'm home, I like eat the same thing almost every day, but like yeah. one o'clock, I'm hungry, really hungry. And then I'm fine for the rest of the day if I don't eat. And this um, is a good skill because you but, absolutely can eat exactly the same thing for weeks. Yeah. I'm She's okay so with that. happy. Like I just yeah, stick to we're both that way. We can yeah. eat over and I over and over again. I rotate. Uh, and it's interesting because after we talked last talked to you guys a week ago, I guess it was, um, I have been kind of playing around with eating twice a day instead of having that third meal. And um, I texted Juliana. I was like, am I ever going to get hungry? Because I don't get hungry no. anymore. Like, it even I even ate before we did this, and I was telling Brian, I'm like, I'm actually – I'm. Like I'm hungry, but I'm not like I'm gonna fall on the floor and if I don't get food. It's very interesting in even just a short amount of time, the difference it's made in and and I'm kind of like I'm I don't have that as like I I don't I'm not thinking about food all the time either. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna eat my two meals and that's it. So it's interesting. Everything is um, habit. Everything about food is habit. Everything. Yes. Yeah. Um, is there a time of day somebody at this was actually one that somebody asked, is there a, a time of day by which it's optimal to stop eating earlier is probably better. So in terms of, in terms of, you know, take out this, I, this survival trait called appetite. That's perfectly normal in a calorie scarce world where you don't have access. 
and then put us in our new environment and say, now we're going to optimize the system, not necessarily just on the biology, but on the biology plus our behaviors so that we're not always miserable and we're not always fighting our, our habits. So I would say it's, I, it's optimal to eat earlier and probably by two to four o'clock at that period of time, sometime about then. But I would say, as we talk about in the book, so long as you probably aren't eating within around four hours of going to bed, that's probably the biggest thing. Is that? Yeah, no, you definitely don't want to go to bed on a full stomach and just your hormones are geared up to be better, more, you know, better at absorbing, better at more efficient earlier in the day, just because everything is on a circadian clock, which we talk about in the book as well. But so, you know, and you don't want to go to bed on a full stomach because it disrupts sleep. It disrupts, you know, all the processes that happen. Absorption is a very intensive process and it takes away from all that metabolic housekeeping time that's so critical when you're sleeping. So you want to, you know, just to allow the mel melatonin to kick in and to allow all of that, that whole process, uh, that cascade of events that needs to happen for optimal sleep. It's best to just be empty stomach by the time you go to bed. And yeah, I mean, if you could shift, ideally, you know, if, you if you're if you going to eat two meals a day, which is, you know, a good thing, one or two times a day, you want to do it earlier as long as you're okay for the rest of the day. But I really, I've seen a lot of people, and again, I always say, you know, we always say that everything is about food is habit, so you can change this. But a lot of people seem to be either early preferable, early preferentiating versus later preferentiating. Like I really need, love to eat midday. She almost slipped. She said that need, need, you guys heard that. Yeah. Replay it. You'll hear it. No, but it's true. She, she really is. She really is that creature of habit. And I'm that you creature of habit. Yeah. And you guys are this creature of habit. And one thing we need to really press upon people out there is that these habits can be changed. So Jessica, you're, sensation that you're suddenly sensing things differently as you l eat less frequency. Remember, think about it. Your body, no matter what you decide to swallow, and you know, we swallow a whole lot of crap and somehow our body has to juggle with it. And it's going on way after for four to six hours after you swallow, your body's still dealing with it. And that is a, an adaptive evolutionary priority in a calorie scarce world. I need to, my, our bodies need to, go through this and really take each one of those meals seriously. It doesn't matter if it's a Snickers bar or, you know, or hummus and, and pita. Our bodies have he to, said to really, hummus. I did. Mm. I had, so, so what we do is, you know, it becomes that priority. So in anticipation of your regular meals, your body starts before you actually start swallowing. Your body starts with the mouth watering. Your body starts with digestive juices. Your body starts the grumbling, which is the stomach doing its thing. It's, it rings the food like, you know, ringing laundry. And so these anticipatory events are, are actually centered around what you most habitually do. So what you, I'm laughing because my stomach literally just growled. There you go. Right. And, and this is because like, we're talking about food. Because we're talking about food, you're actually, you actually do it. And what's really ma amazing for any person that's done long-term fasting, medically supervised, long-term fasting is one of the things you happen, and I'm feeling it right now, my mouth is starting to water, and my mouth is water because we're talking about food. And, and you know, hummus and, especially. And, and I'm, I need to eat. Actually, we ate before. But I, I, know I, would, I would eat right now because I'm getting myself geared up. So a lot of it is it's the food porn on Instagram. It's looking at these things. It's these habits. And so it's not surprising, Jessica, that when you change the pattern by which you were eating, you naturally see that, oh, wow, I need a lot less. I'm, a, I'm not surprised by that at all. Uh, all right. Moving right along. In the HealthSpan solution, you give us the six daily threes, but you shy away from giving us specific, a specific plan of eating or even the number of servings each recipe makes sometimes. What does that reveal about the relationship you want us to have with food? That's a really good question. So we want to make it as easy as possible, and that's why we love our list of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices, because... There are, I say infinite, he gets mad when I say infinite because it doesn't mean anything, but to me it means something. There are infinite combinations of those ingredients that you could make to meet your preferences, to change, whatever. So we try to make it very simple. But from a as a dietitian, 
I would be remiss to say that you do need to be mindful of what you're eating. And that that is why I came up with Six Daily Threes many years ago in terms of, you know, I had Pyramid and I had a plate and that was before I had our triangle from Raymond. But um, the Six Daily Threes is a way to prioritize. So I w- these are the foods, well, it's five of our foods and one is uh, X movement. And the five food groups that are so unique, nutritionally speaking, that you can't get elsewhere. So I'll just to list them for those of you that haven't seen it. And it is on our, even if you go to healthspansolution.com, I, we have a whole post about six daily threes and you get the visuals and everything. So leafy green and cruciferous vegetables, uh, nuts and seeds, legumes, uh, fruits and other colored vegetables. And so we want you to have three servings of all of those, because if you do that, you will get your base nutrient needs, except for the notable nutrients like B12 and D. And we could talk about that too. But so it's a way to prioritize, like for instance, whole grains, fabulous, culinarily, you know, delicious and adds to diversity and satiety, not unique nutritionally. So those are, you can bring that on, on top. So it's more of a way of thinking priority, and, you know, in terms of portion sizes, doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Like you could, if you, let's say you want to make four different dishes and have a little of each. Like I like to have a buffet or you just want to make one recipe. So you're going to eat a whole, you could have a, one of those bowls all by yourself as one meal, or you could have four, you know, one of the, a little bit of the bowl, a little bit of that, you know, the uh, rollatini, a little bit of this, uh, the sriracha stuffed mushrooms. Like you could have a little bit of everything. So it doesn't really matter. Like it really doesn't matter. You don't need to calculate. We don't, we discourage counting carbs, protein, and fat. We actually don't want anyone to talk about that stuff at all. We don't recommend counting calories. None of that stuff matters. You know, you use, you know, we, in terms of, we do a lot of weight, we do lifestyle transformation and weight loss with our clients. So, you know, if you're not losing, because we have them get on the scale every day, then you need to eat less. And it's that simple, you know, so we want to keep it as simple as possible. Oh, there you go. Voila. (laughs) <laughs> oh, fancy. And we will we will put a link below in the description so everybody can check out your website. Yes, absolutely. But um, so that actually you, kind of, you led into, which I knew <laughs> you would, uh, my next question, uh, which we actually talked about because uh, you, Juliana, watched our first video about us eating our potato diet. And one of the most uh, meltdown moments of the entire video was when Brian and I were in the kitchen and I was on this very uh, little thing here, writing to try to calculate how many potatoes I would need to get 1200 calories per day. I was going on a road trip and I had to bring my potatoes with me. And so I wanted to make sure that I had at least 1200 calories per day of potatoes with me. Because at that point, again, I didn't really know what I was doing and I, I was still in this mentality of I've heard all my life, you know, I heard somewhere a study, whatever, it's like 1200 is the minimum you should get. And so I was freaking out. I'm, you know, eating potatoes. I've got my mom calling me. Are you okay? Are you sure this is safe? Is this going to be, you know, all concerned about me? I've got, I'm reading things on the internet about potato diets and how Pendulette's crazy and you shouldn't do this. And yet I'm doing it anyway. Um, And so for me, the only sort of thing to turn my anxiety off was to go back to that, okay, well, as long as I eat 1200 calories a day, I'll be fine. Um, So I just kind of wanted your perspective on that because you texted me and asked me, uh, why are you counting the calories? And then Brian and I had the same argument, which we've had like 50 times again. And I've (laughs) measured hundreds of metabolisms. So lots of people talk about metabolism that have never actually measured one. Um, and I've I've measured hundreds of them. So the very first thing I want to do to set this up is let's not talk about food because everybody has an opinion about food. So let's talk about our bank accounts. Now, you could, if you wanted to arbitrarily compare your deposits that you make in your bank account every day with your checks that you write, you could do that. It's a really good thing. And you know what? As long as you don't write a check more than the daily deposit, you always have money in the account. Likewise, if you really want to compare the amount of food that you eat in a day and the amount of food that you compare in the day, you can do it, but it's arbitrary. It doesn't matter. What really matters when you're writing checks, whether they're metabolic checks or whether they're checks from your bank account, is what's the account balance. And you are fretting over a couple hundred calories 
when you're cal- when you're probably cal- carrying you know 300,000 cal- calories around this is the these I'll go to this one this is our energy storage organ and it doesn't matter if you eat the energy one, storage, organ storage organ <laughs> of another animal or plant, you don't. This is a need, wholesome show, right? right. You <laughs> don't okay. need to eat the energy storage organ of another animal or plant, potato or fat of lard, if you want to go there. The bottom line is you don't need to eat another organism's storage organ to burn your own. What you need is a deficit. Now, everybody then goes to extreme and says, well, you know, okay, we don't need to eat anything. And that's true. I mean, I've been 24 days without food and I was just fine. I was medically supervised. There's other complications with it. Not saying that anybody should fast to lose weight. None of our clients fast to lose weight. But the longest medically supervised water fast was 382 days. So if this idea of starvation mode is my body is hanging on the fat, so I can't put my body in starvation mode. And when I don't have, when I go into starvation mode, my body doesn't use its energy storage organ. It uses its muscle and its tissue and its organs and its brain. Those organisms that use their muscle and organs and brain instead of their energy storage organ when they had a deficit, they didn't jump into the gene pool with the same gusto as our real ancestors that just burned fat. So the bottom line is, if you're not swallowing and you got a pulse, you have a metabolism. And whatever that metabolism is, if you have a deficit, your body is going to make up for that deficit with calories. And so the concept that a person needs to eat more to lose weight is just nonsense, absolute nonsense. And I'll challenge anybody with a actually a midlife crisis, California girl catching calorimeter in the garage, I'll, I'll, I'll challenge anybody to prove that's true. Because what I've seen is that this book right over here, the Harris Benedict equation, it's just over Juliana's uh, shoulders there on the right. I've seen that all of what they measured a hundred years ago in 1919, all of what they, uh, all that what they measured is exactly what I measure in the lab when I measure it today with my fancy pants, you know, calorimeter. So in terms of food, um, you don't want to fast every day just because it creates a whole level of complications from blood pressure to bowel movements to impacted um, pals when you're refeeding to electrolyte swings. You know, when they put these people on naked and afraid, they know they're not going to eat much. But you know what they do when they get off the island? They control the refeeding and refeed them in a right way. If everybody was dropping dead because of 21 days out there, they wouldn't be having the show. So the, so the point is you don't have to eat as much. You don't have to worry as much. And, you know, particularly if you were having potatoes, you know, Wendy's is around every corner. You know, you just go through there, buck 73. You can have as many I, potatoes if you I want. I actually, <laughs> so that's funny because when I was on that road trip where before I had the meltdown and was about to leave on the road trip, because I, Brian, I went with my mom and uh, the next, I didn't bring enough potatoes. You know why I didn't bring enough potatoes? Because Brian interrupted <laughs> my calculating. Uh, <laughs> I told you to bring more potatoes. Yes, I didn't have enough potatoes. And I am really sad that the footage of me carrying around baked potatoes in the hotel searching for a microwave did not make yeah. that cut of that video. Yeah, but and, and we don't recommend super long video. potatoes <laughs> to do this. And we know why you guys did it. We know what the thing went pan and we know what we do with our clients. But the truth of the matter is, is if you'll buy the Hellspan Solution or any other whole food plant-based cookbook, pick a couple of recipes and eat those recipes. You can obtain the same thing. Our clients don't eat potatoes every day. Our clients don't pass. Uh, I'm sorry, don't fast. And we absolutely tell people that too. Yeah, so it's interesting you say that because I definitely want to ask you about that topic, but we are gonna, this video is gonna be eight (laughs) hours long and Brian's gonna get really upset. And so we are gonna have to save, that's gonna be like a teaser because we're gonna talk about that in the next part of this video. Yes. But before we end this part, we wanna end this on a little bit of fun. So we're gonna read a comment that was posted on our most recent video and we just, just wanna know your thoughts on it. All right, comment goes as is. Want to lose weight? Just reduce your food intake and make sure you're not eating rubbish. It's that simple. I'll never understand why or how people let themselves become so obese. No respect for themselves. Wow. Yeah, so first of all, the good news is they're correct. The bottom line is is that you eat less, you're going to burn body fat. In terms of the respect side, 
I would argue the opposite. I would argue that because we evolved in a calorie scarce world, that appetite isn't a trait of negative selection. So people that are overweight don't have an appetite problem. They have an access to food problem. And why, what I would offer as evidence of this is everywhere in the world that flu, food has become more available, obesity has ensued. So even if it were a negative trait of selection, the bottom line is, is that more people are doing it despite the health outcomes. But most of those health outcomes don't happen until after reproductive prime. And we talk about that in the book, after the 45 to 50. So I would say, look, this has nothing to do it has nothing to do with being overweight or underweight. And for all the people that say, hey, you look pretty fat, why don't you lay off the lattes? The same people say you look really gaunt because you're a vegan or whatever they want to say. People comment on weight when they're big. They comment on weight when they're small. We sort of don't worry about that. We just look at it as a temporary state. But the other thing that I'll say at the same time, which will echo the sentiments of that is, if you want to change, you can do it. You can stop swallowing. It's really not that hard. And even for the people that elect for the surgical, what I call, uh, I call it barbaric surgery, not bariatric, bariatric surgery, because I think that if you take the time to learn, like you guys have done, that you can go through it. I'm not saying it's easy or trivial, but I'm saying that you can do it. And so... I remained overweight. Now I can talk first person on this. I remained overweight because I chose not to do it. Now I, I failed a lot of times. I had a lot of wrong pathways that I went down, but I was trying. But ultimately I succeeded and 10 years, 11 years later, I'm still down in weight. And so I, I really would, I would really challenge the person because there's no reason to insult people on this. But then at the same time, for all those people that just get into the empathy, we toss empathy right out the door with all of our clients. We replace humor and unyielding accountability for empathy, and we don't empathize with anybody because you can should yourself to death. You don't need to should yourself. You need to just absolutely, and that's clean family show. You need to, you need to, you need to really get on it. So that I'll get off my soapbox now. That's funny that you say that about the empathy because we were just talking about that. Um, it's just. And Brian was saying, what were you saying about it? You were saying something about the empathy thing. Oh, I don't remember. He, you, it was just, it was just, it's just such a, an interesting way of looking at it because I do think sometimes we are just, you know, we're just being too empathetic with people just because that's your nature. Like I'm a very empathetic person by nature. And so I want to be empathetic, but it's like tough love kind of thing sometimes that you have to get into. You can't. Yeah. I'm, you know. I'm empathetic too. And to double that as a as a dietitian, I was taught to be empathetic with my clients. They teach you how to counsel in a very empathic way. And you don't get results like that. I never got the results that I get now doing it this way with humor. And, you know, there, it's not not empathetic. It's like, yeah, we've all been there. We've all made that decision to keep eating something we're not supposed to be eating or just overeating. Or we've all made these stupid decisions out of emotion or habit or whatever. We've all done that. So we can we can kind of relate to it. But we it's funny because that's not on our plan. That's not the goal. And that's what I love about what you guys are doing is you've shown that it doesn't matter. You guys are getting through this and you're making amazing, amazing things happen just by sticking to it. And it, and you don't need... We still it, make stupid decisions. Oh, yeah. All the time. Oh, yeah. Like anybody that thinks that it's perfect, like no. we're, we're, you know, we're Especially perfectly normal. Especially when we're normal, together. You know, and it's so easy when you're with yeah. someone who loves to eat the same kind of food. Yeah. We love to do it. So losing weight and not gaining weight are two totally different things. And that's one thing your audience really has to understand. You can eat a ton more food and not gain. And this is where I think all the personal trainers get it wrong because they, hey, look at me, you know, I got my abs, you know, I'm 20, 30 years old. I'm yeah, do what I'm doing, going, right? do exactly or what I'm doing. Or then there are the old ones, you know, look at me, I'm trying to be, you know, Mr. Musclehead, right? But the fact of the matter is, and, and if they want to do that, that's fine. But to try to use that as a, the pinnacle of health is crazy. The bottom line is, is that there's a normal level of adiposity and it's probably not six pack abs. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's also an amount of uh, adipose that at some point is unhealthy and to make it about looks, whether it's accepting it or rejecting it is crazy. 
And so if you want to, if you want to test your calibrator, if you want to test and say, am I, have I been, you know, misled over the years? Here's how, here's your test. Right now you're on YouTube. As soon as you finish this video, I want you to go search for my favorite show as a kid growing up. That was when cartoons were Saturday morning cartoons and that's all they were. You couldn't watch them all the time. Nice little train, nice little, uh, of show called Soul Train. I want you to Google Soul Train, Get Off Foxy. That's a song that was popular in the 70s, 80s. I was like out there on the skating rink doing that stuff, m older than I should be. Not dating anyway, yourself at all. <laughs> the, bottom line, the bottom line is I want you to do it and you watch what you're about to see. If you see skinny people, you have been warped because those are normal size human beings. And every now and then you'll see somebody has a little bit of hips, but not by anything by today's standards. At the same time, go look at Willy Wonka, the original one, and look at the remake and look at Augustus, the little chubby kid, right? Because he wasn't really that fat in the first movie. So the bottom line is our entire society has been stretched both in our perception. And this is what selfie face is like. Everybody thinks, oh, wow, look at me. I look great at this angle. I look great. Oh, that's a bad picture. Delete, 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 delete. No, you just look like you. <laughs> Not, Not the, the right, right angle. angle. <laughs> this is all your brain playing tricks with you. Okay? And so the truth is, is that I would absolutely agree that losing weight is a choice. And I don't want to hear anybody say that they can't do it. I do understand it's a difficult, and I understand why you failed listening to some of the advice you've probably had in the past. But I would, I would really encourage you to sort of make that change first because I did it the other way around. I lost my weight, then I did the plant-based diet. It would have been a lot better for me to switch to that. And I don't mean vegan junk food. So we're not talking vegan here. We're just talking about a whole food plant-based diet that you hear from um, Jessica and Brian every day. Make that change first. And I mean significant. Do it. Pick a pick something that's worth it. Nobody brags about, you know, climbing up the little grass hill. They they brag about climbing Everest. So pick three months, pick six months, and don't involve anybody. Stop, get, get off Facebook, get off support groups. Don't talk to your friends and family. Don't tell them about the latest stuff. Just do it. Be quiet and swallow the right food. And I think you'll have success. So that's my soapbox. I love that. That's great. I'm actually getting chills because I'm so I'm just so excited for our listeners, our viewers to see this. And because yeah. all they, you know, you guys just have so much knowledge and it's just, yeah, it's insane. I don't know. I'm like, Aww. geeking out. Okay, <laughs> leave me alone. We love it too. I'm not gonna yes. cry. Um, I think on that note, since I don't think anything can be better said than what you just said. Um, You're not broken. I think we should close You're this one out. You're not broken. We all need I, to repeat it over and over. I'm not broken. And you're not. It's just the food. It's it, you, you can change this. It just requires a dedication. You guys dedicated yourself yep. and you've made this much change and you have some more goals of change you want to make and you'll be able to succeed just like you did the last time. It's not magic. It's not rocket science. Yeah. But, but this time we're not telling anybody our goals and we can touch on hey. that next time too. Yeah. I, <laughs> I just wanted to say uh, what you said kind of resonated with me in, in that last little bit there, you know, because we aren't broken. But my dad has, uh, has a really great saying that we are finished works in progress. Go. And so, you know, it's just a question of like, we're constantly moving towards that, that point of bettering ourselves. And this is just one aspect of that. But it's, it's something that, that, you know, people should be mindful of. You know, we need to to be healthier ab about it because the world is definitely turning into a more unhealthy place yes. day after day. And so I'm glad that that we, both of us, uh, are, are out here. In our own way. <laughs> in our own way, trying to help people out and trying to make the world just a little bit healthier. And, and we're, what we're doing is literally what you said. We're just trying to show people that this, mm -hmm. you can do this. Yes. Because if we can do this, yeah. you can do All this. Food <laughs> All food is habit. All food is habit. Yep. All right. I think Brian should close it out. All right. Let's do that. Uh, folks, find us on all of our social media platforms and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest and all that kind of good stuff out there. Uh, you can message us on there uh, if you want to do so. It's, you know, we greatly appreciate that. Also, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. We are always trying to grow the channel and get our message out to more and more people. 
And that is very simple to do. You just click the subscribe button and the bell that is right next to it. So you get notified whenever we post a new video. Also, like and share the video. I know I'm asking a lot, but I, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, so we can get this message out to more people. It's that simple. Uh, but I think that's all I got. That's all I got. I know that that's not all they have, and we could keep <laughs> going for a very long time. <laughs> but we will see you next time when we bring you part two of uh, this great interview with uh, Juliana Hever and Ray Cronice, authors of The Health Span Solution. Buy it today. And we will oh, see you wait, next time. I just thought of something else. Oh my goodness. I always think of, I always do this. <laughs> also, you guys are on YouTube now. Yes. And you haven't posted really any uh, videos per se. You have the one live video that you posted. So we're gonna put a link below to all the stuff that we talked about, including that weird video that Ray told you to check out and <laughs> after this one. And we're gonna put a link to their YouTube channel so you can subscribe because I know that they're gonna have amazing content coming out mm -hmm. and you guys don't wanna miss it. Either way, we will see you next time on Crocs in the Kitchen. Bye. Bye.